So, um, yeah, I guess we'll get started. It's about five minutes after time. So, as you guys probably saw from the previous uh, talk about the game, etc., I recognize a lot of faces here. Um, this is a more in-depth look at the badge and, you know, how you script it and, you know, kind of what the APIs are that are there, etc. cetera. So, um, you know, we saw this slide in my last presentation, right? I mean, not much to it, but the jumpers, where the score, the seven-segment display, and then the OBD2 port um, is of interest. And, uh, you know, you, you guys don't have to memorize this by any means. I mean, on, on carhackingvillage.com, um, all these presentations, <clears throat> the SDK, uh, pawn help documentation, everything's available there for download. So, um, but I did want to just kind of run through, you know, as far as what the jumpers are on the side, just so you can kind of get a scope of what the badge capabilities might be. So, you know, I guess starting in the upper, um, uh, left-hand corner, um, that's the UART interface. All, all, of these, all of these different positions on the jumper as well, you can see in the silk screen on the badge kind of guides where all these things are as well. Um, so the FTDI connector, um, which is just the standard um, USB to TTL UART uh, connector that you can buy basically anywhere, um, you know, goes up there. Um, that's for the host port, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, down from that is, is the first output um, that you can control through the scripting language. Um, below that are the four inputs that can also be read and uh, trigger events in the uh, scripting language. So just some general purpose input outputs to whatever you want to interface to. Um, but the last four segments are, are basically how you select um, what OBD2 interface pins you want to use. So by default, the badge is populated such as you're using high-speed CAN. Um, the micro only has one CAN controller, but we support three different CAN interfaces on the OBD2. So the jumpers are the way to basically tell the badge which CAN channel you want to listen to, right? Um, so the, the, the first two, you could have either, um, you know, the purple or the light blue. Um, it's one or the other. So if they're up... On the purple one, you're going to use a single wire CAN transceiver. So that comes out, um, I believe, on pin one, and now you can talk over the GM stuff. Um, if it's in the blue position, then you're using dual wire CANs. So what that's going to do is that's going to route, um, you know, the CAN channels or the the CAN lines from the micro out to the dual wire CAN transceiver. The bottom jumpers um, basically select which dual wire CAN interface do you want to use on the OBD2 connector. Um, by default, the bottom ones are populated because we're using HS CAN on pin 6 and 14. But if you're on a Ford and you want to look at like the, the medium speed body bus and see things going on in there or do other things, you can, you know, instead of populating on position D, you can populate on position C, right? So it, it's flexible. I mean, you can't Obviously, you can't control this in software, um, but as somebody pointed out, you know, with a little bit extra hardware and using the GP outputs, you could easily do some sort of mux, demux thing there to switch this dynamically, right, with the script. Um, so this is basically what I just talked about, right, but I put it in here just for reference when you go back through these slides later. So... What is Pawn? So Pawn is the scripting language that um, I chose to put on the badge. Um, and these are kind of like the highlights from it, right? So it is C-like, which we'll see. Um, and it's compiled, but it's interpreted on the device. Um, the language is really designed for scripting embedded targets. However, you know, I have heard things that is used in the desktop world as well. I think... Uh, I think it's used as part of like the Half-Life 2 engine, the Half-Life engine to do scripting for mods, etc. So as you search the internet for Pawn, you'll come across IDEs that are out there. Those are kind of really set up for like Team Fortress and stuff like that. So they kind of have their hooks in there. But, you know, some of those IDEs, I mean, you could use to, to do this with as well, right? Um, you just have to know the APIs that are, you know, specific to this badge, which we'll talk about. Um, 
You know, I think interpreted languages allow for fast, for safe. Pawn is very fast um, and efficient updates to the embedded system. Safe in the sense that, you know, there really aren't any types, right? So you don't have to worry about stuff like that. Um, all the details as far as like how to set up the CAN controller and send messages in and out and handle interrupts, all, all that's taken care of for you. So what you get in this pawn environment is a very high level mechanism for sending, receiving messages and doing other things that embedded systems typically do. Um, I think that it's easier to write than traditional embedded programming paradigms for the, for the reasons I just talked about, right? So um, as you'll see, some of these scripts that do, you know, some meaningful things are usually about six lines, tens lines long, right? And you can get a lot done. Um, Pawn is open source. It was created by this gentleman, which I'm sure I'll pronounce his name wrong, Theadmir. <laughs> um, and, you know, I have the link here as well for future reference. If you go to this website, you'll see all of his documentation, um, which is excellent. Uh, he did a great job documenting his creation, talking about how to use it, uh, examples. Um, the documentation is absolutely great. Uh, it's more than just like an API document would read. It, he, he gives a lot of motivations for the choices he made, and he talks about... Um, you know, compromises that he made when he, when he designed this language. So I, I, think, I think the documentation is absolutely perfect. Um, just some high-level differences. And as you, as you guys and gals dive into Pawn, you know, this is just stuff that I listed here off the top of my head. But, I mean, one of the big things, semicolons are optional at the end of statements in Pawn. Um, if you put them there just out of habit, which I do, it doesn't hurt anything. You don't have to have them there. So... Um, there's really only one type, and that's kind of referred to as a cell. On this target, it's, it's a 32-bit quantity, right? So if you make an array, you know, every element in the array is 32 bits long. Um, the, the tag itself, you know, has the capability to, um, I'll look back through here, but it, it's, it's about 20K worth of RAM that's allocated towards the towards the pawn side of things. And I felt like with that, I mean, you can, you can do a lot with that. I mean, even though they're four bytes in size and you might have big arrays, you, sh you should still be able to get a lot of stuff done. Um, there are some new keywords, which we'll touch upon. Um, it does support structured data, but not in the traditional, like, struct fashion that C does it. It basically uses, like, uh, named elements in arrays, so you can assign, like, tags to array positions. Um, so when, when you look at the code, it, it does kind of look like how you would get at C structure elements, but um, it's a little bit different how you have to set it up. Um, there's no linking phase with the pawn compiler. Um, so if you have a script that spans multiple files, you have to, you have to pull them all together using includes. Um, no function prototypes, um, and in... This implementation, the badge implementation, um, there's no dynamic memory. So, you know, if you globally allocate an array, if you're going to use it across functions, right, if, if, if CAN messages are coming in, you know, you can use that data there, but once that function returns, that data is gone unless you copied it someplace else, et cetera, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> So when we look at what pawn is with the badge, um, you know, by its pawn by itself, it's 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 basically the language, the interpreter, the compiler, and some standard libraries that support core operations. That's part of the pawn package that you can download. It's freeware, etc. Um, but really, where pawn shines is you can easily extend pawn with these native extensions. So, and this is what's been added for the badge. So there's things, there are extensions that you can get to that look just like function calls, um, for the most part, that allow you to do things like sending canned messages and setting timers and doing stuff like that. Um, you know, the way I like to think of it is, you know, the badge provides this library of things you can do, and Pawn is the thing that glues the application. You know, it's, it's the application. It glues it all together. So QCM is, it's, I put this in here because you'll see references to QCM, um, you know, on the badge itself. There's like a rev and there's a part number, stuff like that. Um, 
for, for lack of a better terminology, a while ago I just came up with this idea of like these quick can module, which is kind of, I don't really like it too much, I guess, but it's, you know, it works, you know, it's just an acronym. Um, and this badge is actually a mini version of this product suite that I have. Um, you know, the, the more advanced versions of these things, um, and you could talk to me about them if you're interested in them. You know, add things like Wi-Fi and multiple CAN interfaces so you can do like easily CAN gateway functionality. Runs three times faster. So if you're gatewaying CAN messages, like it's literally microseconds of delay between messages passing through back and forth. Um, the badge, you know, you, you, could, you could use two badges to kind of do that, but it won't be as fast and it won't be as, as feature rich as some of these other things. Um, so the classic place that everybody starts, hello world. So this is a fully compilable, compilable um, Hello World script. And basically you can see that it looks like C, right? There's a main. Um, and they use, um, you know, brackets to denote blocks. And they have a built-in function that's called printf that's just like C, no semicolons. Um, and basically what this does is it calls this native extension called QCM console enable. What that does is that, and I'll talk about it here in the next slide a little bit more, but it basically allows the script to output through the UART port, right? Because by default, the UART port is set to reprogram scripts. Well, you got to tell the engine, I want to take control of it. So the scripts can do that. And then just to clean up at the end, we disable it. That's optional. Um, so as I mentioned, scripts control the port's destiny. So if you want to do UART-based I.O. with the scripts, you've got to tell the QCM system, I'm going to use a UART port. And that's how you do it with the QCM console enable. Um, but the big thing is, once you call that enable call, it's not going to pay attention. The badge is not going to pay attention to scripts trying to be loaded onto it anymore. Because the, the script itself has control of the UART port. Um, so what happens if you call enable, but you never call disable? Can you never program the badge again? Not the case. So there's a, up in the top corner uh, of the badge, there's a jumper that up in the top right-hand corner, select script clear when present, which is also switch input. So when that jumper is closed and the module, you know, if you, if you just like tweak the battery so it resets, it will not run the script and stay in loading mode. So if you have like a script that's blocking access to be able to reload it, this is the way to recover it. It's just an easy way. Um, the rest of the QCM modules have a switch on them, which is a little bit more convenient because you just apply power while you're holding the switch, and then it'll just default into the, the loader mode. So I mentioned before, and I've, I've mentioned it to several of you guys, um, you know, the SDK is out there. Um, basically, uh, the SDK in itself consists of two utilities, this compiler, the pawn compiler, and this loader, the thing that allows you to load scripts onto the badge. Um, it has some, some pawn include files, which are where th all of these QCM extensions live, right? Um, it has several examples, which we'll go through some, some excerpts from those. And uh, there is some documentation that's in there as well from the pawn website. Um, that talks about, there's a great getting started guide for Pawn, and then there's like the language reference guide. Uh, they're both really good to come up to speed quickly on, on the language. Um, you know, there's no fancy IDE right now besides the ones that, you know, might be for some other implementation of Pawn. Um, so, you know, use your favorite text editor, create scripts. Um, you know, maybe someday there'll be a specific IDE for it. Um, but... For now, it's just a simple on a command line, um, and I can give demos of this back at the village. Um, I didn't bring my stuff here to, to, to do it, but you know, in, in the SDK, I'm gonna I'm gonna invoke this thing called pawn CC, and I'm gonna pass it a script that's hello world dot p. All the all the pawn stuff ends with a dot p. At least that's the extension that I've always used. And when you run that, now you result the resulting file that comes out is this hello world dot amx which that is the compiled pawn binary. 
that's going to be sent to the module or to the badge. So once you have this AMX thing, there's the second utility, this QCM loader utility, which you'll see in the SDK, and as I mentioned, we'll, we'll give examples of it, um, where we call it, and we basically give it the hello world.amx, and you run that, you'll see output that says it loaded it to the badge, and kaboom, you're good. Um, there is one option, it's this dash C option, and it's mainly there for convenience. So. When you have the dash C option there, basically what that does, it, it keeps the, in, in the QCM loader utility, it keeps the port open so that if you're using printfs, it just is there. That way you don't have to like load the script and then, you know, once that's done, open up a different program like TerraTerm or some other serial, you know, terminal program to CIO. It'll just do it right there. So it's, it's kind of convenient. <clears throat> so we'll get a little bit further into like, uh, pawn fundamentals here. Um, I really like how pawn handles this concept of event handling. Um, basically, you know, when you look at an embedded system, you know, you have interrupt handlers, you have things that are always, the application is always responding to stimulus. The user pressed a button, a message received, something changed, a timer expired, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, you know, traditionally, I mean, you could either pull for them or you can set up, you know, interrupt handlers and you can have all this logic to do this stuff. The nice thing about Pawn is it has this built-in concept of these event handlers, things that will seemingly be called asynchronously when these types of events occur. Um, they look a lot like functions, um, but they just have a special name. And we'll see here what they look like. Um, so just keep this event handler thing in the back of your mind. You're going to see some here coming up in these examples, this next one. So, you know, there are, there are basically, you know, a, a core set of functionality that, that is exposed to Pawn. You know, the first one, the first fundamental one is timers. In embedded system, you've got to have a timer, right? I've got to send a message every 250 milliseconds. I have to change the GPIO port pin every 500 milliseconds. I've got to get an event, wait one second, and do something else, right? So the badge supports five timers, um, two modes. You can either be a one-time timer or it can repeat over and over again. Um, and the way the code looks, again, you'll see the main, but you see this other function up here now. It's called timer zero, and the SDK talks about, you know, the special names for these things. But what this says is if we look at the main first, we call this function called timer start. We tell it we want to start timer zero. We tell it the number of milliseconds, and then the last, the last thing is, do you want it to just be a one-time timer, or do you want it to go off all the time? You know, so when, when 250 milliseconds goes by, it restarts itself, and you'll get an event, you'll get an event, you'll get an event. So what this says, and what, what, how this is going to work is, you know, the second you call QCM timer start, that timer is going to start, and that event handler at timer zero is going to run when that timer expires. Right, so think of them as like event handlers are, they're your functions that have a specific name that seemingly get called somehow, right? The system calls them when these events occur. So very simply, when the timer expires, you, you have, you know, inside of timer zero, it prints timer expired, right? Very, very straightforward, I think. Um, when we start looking at GPIO, this is the other core functionality, right? So we're going to have timers, we're going to have GPIO, we're going to have CAN, right? Um, GPIO, the badge, has four output channels and it has six input channels. Um, when we look at, like, output functionality, they can be driven high or low from the scripts. Inputs, there are two ways you can read inputs. You can either pull for them, right, through a function to say, hey, give me the state of this input or you can set up those event handlers that I was talking about uh, to where you specify, hey, I want to be, I want an event every time this GPIO goes from low to high, or do you want an event every time it goes from high to low, or you, anytime it changes, right? You can call these event handlers, or the event handler be called. Um, they aren't debounced, so if you're trying to do stuff, you know, with, with your hand, right, you're going to see a lot of events come out, right? But that's kind of intentional because I want the GPIOs to respond as fast as possible, to be as flexible as possible. Um, 
So if we look at another quick example here, again, you know, I always start with these scripts. I just look at main first because main's going to run. And once main falls off the end, pawn is kind of in this idle state waiting for events, right? So typically a lot of the example scripts you'll see in the SDK, all main does is it sets up what you want set up and then everything else is handled by event handlers. Now, main can stick around. You can, you can call a, a built-in routine called sleep inside of like a wow loop or something like that so that it allows the other stuff to, to, to do what it needs to do. But what, what's happening here is, you know, there's this call way at the bottom to say, you know, let's configure this, this GPIO handler and what, what handler do we want to configure? Well, we want to configure this input OBD2, right? And we just want to know anytime we get an event. So event all means anytime it goes from low to high or anytime it goes from high to low, right? And what we'll see here is every time you plug in the OBD2 connector, that event's going to be called. When you unplug the OBD2 connector, that event's going to be called, right? And all this event handler does up here, this at GPIO input OBD2, is it does the pulled mechanism, right? So if, let's get the input OBD2. If that's high, well, we know there's a voltage there and it's plugged in. If it's low, well, we know somebody unplugged it, right? So... You know, all the inputs you can set up this way, right? So, like, if you wanted to watch, you know, all six inputs that are available, you'd have six input, you know, the six handlers up here to do what you need, and you'd have the, you'd have six GPIO configure handler calls down there to set them up the way you want to set them up. So, when we talk about the, the UART that the script can do, uh, we've already seen printf, right, that output stuff. Um, but there's also an event handler there to process data received on UART, um, so it is buffered, and basically the way that it works is you basically just define in your script, you just have this at host RX um, event handler. The, the native stuff will, uh, will see that, and it will just say, anything I receive on UART, I'm going to direct to this. So, <clears throat> you know, main, we enable the console, because we have to. And then this routine here, basically, we get past the data that we got, and we get past the size, Right? The data is an array up to 16 bytes, um, and data size, of course, tells us how many bytes we got. And all this does is it just prints out the what we received in hexadecimal format. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so we get into CAN interfaces. Um, three ways to get CAN messages. So we can tell the system we're interested in a specific CAN ID. <coughs> Excuse me. That's the recommended approach because it filters out a lot of messages coming through, right? Like if you look at a if you look at a high speed uh, HS CAN bus over OBD two, you might see a flood of messages. Um, so that leads me to the next one. You can also set this up to receive all the messages. Um, on some vehicles, that might be a problem for the reason I just mentioned. Other vehicles have a gateway between the OBD2 connector and the actual, you know, internal bus. In that case, it wouldn't be a problem turning on all received messages because you really aren't going to be getting that much stuff back. Then, um, of course, you can use both. That's the third way. You know, you could have some that are specific IDs, and you could have some that you can have the catch-all handler that catches everything else, right? Um, so when we look at this, um, again, starting with main, there's a function. When you look in the SDK, you'll see it. It's called QCM CAN init. We tell it the baud rate. Okay, well, we want to open up the CAN channel at, at 500 kilobits per second. And then just like what we saw with the GPIOs, there's another call that's, that's CAN configure RX handler. Um, it looks like the GPIO configure handler. Um, we tell it what handler we want to use. In this case, it's handler number zero, hence why we have the event handler up there that ends with zero, can RX zero. Um, there are, I believe there are eight. You can have up to eight handlers, eight or ten. I'll have to look at the documentation. Um, but what this is saying is, okay, well, let's set up this can con handler for handler zero. We're interested in, in ID hex 70 zero. And the last false means it's 11-bit. Is it extended is the last parameter. Um, so 
as soon as main falls off the end, the system is configured and it's just sitting around waiting for um, the at can rx0 event handler to be called. And as soon as we receive a 70 zero, kaboom, this gets called and my test code inside of here basically just prints out the fields. And this is what I was talking about, structured data. So there's this thing that looks like an array, this rx message, but it has this capital QCM can message inside of it. If you look in the SDK include directory, you will see the definition for this QCM can message that sets up the structured data for this RX message. And you can see in the printf when we actually get into that structured data, it looks a lot like C, how we would do it. So it's RX message dot ID, RX message is extended, RX message DLC, which is the length of the, of the message on the CAN bus. We loop through the data because that's an embed, there's, there's, a, there's a member inside of uh, QCM CAN message inside of the RX message that basically is a, an array of all the data that came in the message and we print it out. And then just as part of this test, we change the ID to 78 and we just transmit the message back out. So that's what the QCM CAN TX. As soon as you call QCM CAN TX, it sends it, right? So, you know, you could see it's pretty easy if you, if you wanted to just set something up that, let's say we wanted to reverse this where we make a diagnostic request to 7E0 and we're interested in the response, say, on address 7E8. Well, the way that we would modify this is we would set up our RX handler for 7E8 because we're interested on, you know, that message coming back. And then we would just transmit the message that we want. As soon as the engine responds, we would get it and we would process it, right, to reverse this example. This is kind of like from the perspective of the other side. So one of the last things I wanted to talk about, there's another extension that I, to see, I think is, is pretty important to talk about in regards to PON. Because PON is basically designed for embedded systems it has this concept of built-in state machine automation. Um, and the way that it works is, you know, we saw these event handlers up here like CAN RX0 and stuff like that. The way it works is you can define several of the same event handler, but tell it in what state you want that event to be handled. So you could have, <clears throat> Here's an example where let's just do a PWM signal on a GPIO. So we start a timer, timer zero, 250 milliseconds, only this time we pass it true because we want it to just run all the time. And then we use this pawn built-in uh, keyword called state, which means set the state to what I'm going to tell you. So we're going to initialize the state to the state called PWM low. And then you'll see in the event handlers above for timer zero, there are two of them. And the first one has this, this construct after it that says PWM low. And the next timer zero one has this other construct for PWM high. Well, what that means is if the internal state machine is in the state PWM low and you get a timer zero event, it's going to call that top one. If the state, if the internal state machine was in the state called PWM high, which you can just make these state machine names up, I mean the, the state names on the fly, right? The, the compiler knows how to deal with them. It will call the PWM high one um, if you're in that state. So you can kind of see here what's going to happen is timer zero is going to get called first because when, when that timer expires, it's going to set the output to false and then it's going to set the state to PWM high. And because the timer is repeating over and over again, the timer is going to go off again in 250 milliseconds. Well, only now we're in the PWM high state. So the PWM high timer zero handler is going to get called. Um, so on, and then it sets low, so on and so forth. That's basically how, you know, you've seen how I have the scrolling stuff coming across here. I just have a lot of timer zero events set up at a certain interval and every, and with states, and it basically just walks through and, and sets the LCD accordingly, right, for every time that expires. So it's kind of a good thing, like if you wanted to handle you know, like message sequencing, right? So like, you know, you, you send a CAN message and you're going to get back, you, you send a CAN message and you set the state, you're going to get back a response that you're going to want to process in a certain way. Let's say it's 
you know, on a specific ID. You're going to send something else back out and you're going to get a, you're going to get different data, but with like the same ID. Well, you could just have different states for that can handler, so on and so forth. So it's just kind of a way to automate that. Um, Want to see something here? Okay. So I was actually going to open up um, <clears throat> I was just going to open that up here real quick. Maybe. And I was just going to show you the example that, you know, this badge is using um, to show that, that data. Um, so basically what you'll see in here is, and this again is in the SDK, um, how to control this LCD. I copied it here for my reference, but there are several of these at timer event handlers for every single state. And by far, this isn't like the most efficient way to do it at all. Like you could set up an array that has the characters in it and walk through, et cetera, et cetera. But this, this was, was fast to do. Um, so, you know, first state is CAR, those binary things. If you look at the SDK, that's controlling the individual segments so the car shows up. The next one comes in, it shifts it one over, it says AR and X I use for space, and then I set the next state. Next state is R, space, H. The next state is space, H, A. The next space is, or the next state is H, A, C. So on and so forth, um, just to achieve this scrolling effect. So there's a lot of these timer zero event handlers, one for every state. And way down here in Maine, I initialize the state to the first one where it starts with the word C-A-R or the letter C-A-R and then I set up the timer to run every 250 milliseconds and it just walks through. So it's kind of like the... So as you learn more about Pawn and dig into it, you'll see that you know, there are things that can be turned on or off depending upon how Pawn is being used in the system. Um, and these are choices that I've made. I have enabled floating point, so because I thought that that was pretty important because a lot of messages, a lot of data that comes over CAN, you know, might be expressed in a certain unit um, that you might have to multiply by some factor in order to get what you actually need. So like... Um, Miles per hour might be expressed in kilometers an hour, but it's you know offset by a certain number of bits so that they can do fractional values over the bus. Um, if you have floating point built into the scripts, it's very easy to do that. You don't have to do any integer mass shifting, all that other stuff. You can just multiply it by a factor and just be done with it. Um, as I mentioned, there's no dynamic memory allocation. Um, Almost all the core pawn stuff is there. So as you read through pawn, you'll see a lot of these native routines that ship with stock. Um, they're almost all there, except like a couple of string routines. I didn't think it would be useful to have like the UU encode, UU decode routines in the target. So they're just taking up space, got rid of them. Um, Unix time stamping, stuff like that. Um, they also have some socket stuff where you could send UDP in like the core example obviously doesn't apply to this at this point. Um, when I, I mentioned the sleep, you know, there is a sleep routine that can be called uh, in the main routine to kind of like allow event handlers to run. Um, and, you know, the, I'm, I'm basically using the, the latest version of Pawn that you can find out there. Um, and it's actually a little bit more than that because I have other contributions that have not been accepted back into the core edition to work around some bugs that I've come across when using it. So it really is kind of like the bleeding edge of a pawn that's inside of here. I mean, pawn isn't used in a lot of places, but there were some real showstopper bugs that 
would not make some of those examples even possible, right, without, without these fixes. So um, as I mentioned, look in the SDK, download it, carhackingvillage.com. Um, you will see it, it's structured very well. You will be able to go and find your way. Um, I will be available at all times throughout the con back at the Car Hacking Village. Come and talk to me. We can write scripts. I'll show you how to load them. We can go through all of that stuff. Um, I, I, I basically listed a couple ideas because some of you might be like, okay, well, this is great. You know, we could script this thing. You know, what, what are we going to do, right? Um, you know, we saw a script that waits for OBD2 to be connected. Um, so, you know, let's use that to our advantage. So, like, maybe let's use a script that waits for the OBD2 to be connected, then listens for some particular CAN message and shows it on the display. So, like, let's say we wanted to show vehicle speed on the display. It would be very easy to do on a lot of vehicles, right? Um, you could make a simple, uh, simple CAN di diagnostic tool. Um, <laughs> Um, that basically just dumps over the UART CAN messages of interest, right? Um, so it's a way to just, you know, make like a CAN sniffer. Um, because the scripts are persistent and, you know, they're, they're stored when you remove power, of course. I mean, you could program this thing to, as you plug it into vehicles, you know, do some diagnostic stuff, um, query something and send it over UART or figure out something to set and set it on a lot of things or, you know, things like that. Um, you could <clears throat> wait for data on the CAN bus and then resend that data but format it a little bit differently. And depending upon your timing there, you might cause the vehicle to do things that you want it to do, not what it's going to do. Uh, example of this might be, you know, you just saw the speed message come over the CAN bus, change the speed and send it out immediately. I mean, it's going to be sent within, you know, under a millisecond. So the things that are paying attention to speed are going to see that first message, but they're also going to see your message. And they're probably going to take your message over the one because they always take the latest data. So if you're always triggering off of a CAN message and you're always resending it immediately afterwards, you can alter what the vehicle might display or do. Um, an interesting one would be, you know, let's link two badges together and make a crude gateway where you could actually interrupt, you can cut the CAN bus, put one listener here and a transmitter over here, maybe make it bi-directional so you can actually, for the, for the nodes that you can't just repeat data, you want to intercept something that's being sent and you want to modify it um, so that something else, you know, believes what's not really true. Um, two badges could be used to do that. You know, a potential example might be, um, you know, a lot of OEM head units won't, that, that could play DVDs, won't play them if the vehicle's moving. Well, they're paying attention to a speed message, and maybe it's not enough to just retransmit it. Maybe you actually have to intercept the speed message, modify it, and retransmit it, but let everything else go through. Um, you know, you could use two badges to do that. You know, link them together over UART, couple scripts on each side, bang, it's done. Um, and, you know, of course, you don't have to use the OBD2 interface on the badge. I mean, you have some IOs, you got UART, you have a display, interface it to something else and, you know, use Pawn to your advantage there as well. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned, feel free to grab me anytime. Um, I put my email address in here, you know, if you guys want to spam me with stuff. It's easy to set up filters. Um, and, you know, I'm curious to know about your badge experiences. So come and tell me or, you know, feel free to post up to Twitter, you know, to CHV badge and, and share your experiences. But I guess I'll just open up for questions. I mean, I just kind of wanted to give a high-level overview as far as, you know, what the system is, what it can kind of do. You know, until you get in and actually play with it a little bit, it'll probably become a little bit more concrete. But, um any questions? How do you get it? Carhackingvillage.com, which I think I mentioned in here. Um, you can download the SDK there. That's where it lives. 
and the badges, I, if everybody doesn't have them, um, we sold out this morning. We will have at least 80 more for sale tomorrow starting at 10. So you have another chance to get them. They are 50. Yes. Say again. I, I would attend some of the other um, turbo talks that we're doing back in the village. Um, there's there are some talks that address exactly um, you know what you're talking about. We go through some CAN bus examples. We talk about you know the types of things that you can do over OBD and what that looks like and what CAN messaging looks like. You know the whole concept, right? If if you're familiar with like um, you know traditional networking. Um, depending upon your level of familiarity with it, you'll probably find CAN bus to be about 20 years behind that. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a very simplistic messaging paradigm. And, you know, you'll catch on to it very fast because there are some, there are some methodologies that all the manufacturers use to transmit data back and forth, and there are some standards in place. But when it all boils down, you know, I like to think of CAN, it's, it's kind of like UDP to a certain extent where it's a fire and forget type bus and there's a fixed payload and the receivers get it and that's how it goes, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty simplistic. Um, but yeah, grab us, come to more Turbo Talks. We'll bring you up to speed. Yes. Yes, when you download the SDK, they're in there. Everything's there. Oh no. Okay, well we're gonna we're repeating stuff uh tomorrow as well. I think all the talks get repeated tomorrow. And all the slides should be available someplace as well for that. And if you're really interested, just come by and grab us. I mean we'll we'll just go through it with you. I mean we, we wanna we want awareness, we want people to be able to learn, we wanna show people I mean we, we really like this stuff. All everybody involved with the village and we're more than happy to share it with you, the knowledge, bring you up to speed. I mean, that's the whole goal here, right? So, yes. There is. Um, when you come back to the village, uh, there's a company there called Intrepid Control Systems. They, they make what I think is pretty much the flagship. I mean, it's, it's a really good program to do this. And the problem with it is, you know, it is a high-end engineering tool. So I think they have options to get lower cost versions of that, um, perhaps even free versions of it that are limited. Um, but we can show you those tools back there and, and how they work. It's, it's really a, a feature-rich program that allows you to do a lot of stuff. You know, you can find, you can, find uh, you know, can dongles out there that just dump stuff. Um, you know, this, this badge, you could turn it into something like that, as I mentioned, I mean, it has a UR port on it. Um, but as far as like cheap, um, I've seen can dongles out there for not, not expensive. Now you aren't going to get a lot with them, but yeah, exactly. That's where vehicle spy excels, of course. Um, but other ones, um, we'll have to talk to the guys back there to see what their experiences are too. I always use vehicle spy, personally, but. You have to use one of their dongles though in order to, to utilize it. I mean, the badge doesn't work with their software, of course, but um, I think you can get in. I, I'm not sure what the value cans run now. They have like a value can limited. It might be, and don't quote me on this, it's, it's probably on the order of a few hundred dollars, 200, 300, something like that. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's, it's more a limitation of baud rates. So, you know, traditional high-speed CAN buses in, in vehicles are running at 500 kilobits per second. 
It's a lot of data going back and forth. The UART on this is fixed at 23400, 230, right? So if you're translating this binary data into like ASCII data and then you're sending out CAN frames, obviously there's going to be a bottleneck there, right? It can't get all the data through. But if you're selective as far as, you know, what range of IDs you listen to, if you put just a little bit of filtering in there, you could use this. So like let's say you could you could put something in there that sends all the messages that start that are like, you know, 5XX, so 500 so and so. That might be sufficient to open up the bandwidth so that you can, you know, dump that stuff to like a terminal using printf. So that's that's the what I was kind of getting at there. Any other questions? Okie dokie. Well, thank you guys, and I look forward to seeing you back at the village. And uh, as I mentioned, feel free to grab me if you ever have any questions. Thanks.